Hi there, I'm Georgie Ainsley, and every week I talk to someone who is a performance person. They could be an athlete from the world of entertainment, business, or politics. They could even be an astronaut. The key link is, of course, that they all know how to perform at the top level, and they can teach us all a thing or two about how to do that in our own lives at whatever it is that we do. Performance People is available wherever you get your podcasts, or of course, you can watch us on YouTube, where you can also subscribe, and please do. James Allison is a British motorsport designer and engineer, best known for his accomplishments in Formula One, where he's the technical director of the Mercedes AMG Petronas F1 team. He's played a pivotal role in the teams he's been associated with over the years, recording 11 Constructors' Championship titles. In 2021, he also became the chief technical officer at Ineos Britannia, my husband Ben Ainsley's America's Cup team. I was away from the hurly-burly and the fight cliches I know but but that's sort of what Formula One feels like to me and I like I like the fight it's very um, unpleasant uh, to suddenly feel that what you previously felt about yourselves as a group um, has been you know the foundations of that have been loosened by the reality of the stopwatch Imagine how how good that's going to feel, you know, when they've all been looking sympathetically at us, well, with faux sympathy in our direction. And we just suck that up and go, okay, right, well, you know, we're going to work on this and we're going to come back and we're going to show them. And that is definitely a galvanizing thing. Much as maybe the outside world might imagine this is deeply painful internally, and on one level it is, it's also really exciting. James, Season's ended, so I'm imagining for somebody like you, you're straight back in your workshop and you're tinkering away on a numerous amount of projects that you've got going on back at home. Is that what it's been like for you? Is that what it's going to be like for you over the Christmas period? No. It's a it's a common misconception that the season ends and we get a break. Um, but uh, anyone on the inside of the sport knows that the season never ends and the break never comes. The, uh, the, um, the, the, the challenge of next season and the one that you're in currently and the seasons to come mean that you are just continually uh, sort of rolling from one car project into the next without a break at any stage. And the workload actually stays uh, pretty high throughout the whole year, um, with it being probably at its most intense in the factory during the Christmas months, so from from now through to around April is is probably peak workload for for the factory side of things, and the only the only um, actual enforced periods, and it does need to be enforced periods of of grace are during the summer when the sport as a whole shuts down for a couple of weeks, and during Christmas this year for the first time the sport has also decided to impose a compulsory shutdown between uh, New Year's, uh, between Christmas Eve and, uh, and uh, 1st of Jan, 2nd of Jan. So it's, this would be the first Christmas uh, in Formula One in, well, since forever, where people will actually be able to take a few days off in a guilt-free fashion because it's actually imposed at a sport level. How much do you all need that? I mean, you've talked about the fact that they do need to impose these breaks, but I mean, just mentally, physically, we know how exhausting this circuit is for people. But I mean, how important is it just to get some downtime? Uh, Well, I think it's pretty crucial. It it is true to say that it's not universally popular in the team um, because uh, by imposing on the team at a sport level, these known shutdown periods, you effectively take two weeks of annual leave and force that on a team in the first couple of weeks of August. And then you take a second week of their annual shutdown, of their holiday allowance, and you impose that at Christmas. That doesn't leave a huge amount of discretionary holiday out of your holiday allowance to be taken in the remainder of the year. So what that does is it forces on the whole factory to take their holiday in parts of the year where it is actually quite expensive to Mm. take holiday. And, and, and for people who maybe are not forced by their job 
or their role in the company to be uh, omnipresent during the year, um, then it's it's maybe a little bit less flexible and less enjoyable to be told you must take your holiday here and here. Um, but for for a, for a different slab of the company, certainly for me in my role, for anyone who is part of the traveling community that does the the races for um, for uh, any of the management structure of the team and a chunk of the factory as well, this uh, enforced break comes as the most blessed of reliefs because it does just allow you to go and uh, go home, not feel guilty for not opening your laptop or your phone and answering a trillion emails and uh, and just get some rest. So uh, I'm looking forward to it greatly. Are there really going to be? I mean, that, that we talk every year about the increase of races on the F1 calendar. It seems to just grow year on year. They're going to be 24 races next year. I mean, is that actually possible? Uh, well, it's certainly what's scheduled, and uh, and I'm pretty sure now that you know, happily, COVID is behind us and and some stability has returned. I think we can be pretty confident that yes, barring barring major disaster, it will be a 24 race season next year. And that that is pretty, pretty grueling. When you consider that there is also winter testing to be done, uh, which uh, which adds another couple of weekends into the year, you if you're one of the traveling folk, then that is more than half the year spent uh, spent on the road. Um, and uh, and and in a, in a mode of, of of working that is quite tiring and and quite demanding, and then all the people back in the factory who give live support to that as well are, are having to take that burden on their shoulders. And it, yeah, it's um, it's it's definitely a thing. Um, in fact, sufficient of a thing that the sport has just started to address it, because the co- the cost cap means you you can't um, you can't reasonably contemplate saying well it's now sufficiently large number of races that we need to double up on the roles that do the traveling to allow them to sort of alternate races or anything like that it's the financial reality of that makes that prohibitive inside the cost cap for the sport so in order to try to impose some relief on an otherwise very difficult to manage season the sport has just started to debate internally about whether we should have rules that um, that mean that let's say it's a 24 race season, but would mean such that uh, no individual other than the drivers would be allowed to do all 24 races. A cap imposed maybe at 20 races, let's say, just pluck a number from the air, um, which would mean that uh, everyone who had previously going to have to do the full slog would uh would would only be able to do 20 of them and the teams would have to find it in themselves to put uh alternative methods of coping with the absence of each member of that traveling community um four times per year and uh that will be an interesting set of gymnastics to cope with uh but but will at least uh if it's imposed at a sport level won't impose on any individual team uh, a competitive disadvantage. We would all face that hurdle together. Um, the ones that wiggled their way through it in effectively could turn it into an advantage by organizationally uh, managing that in a slick way. But the, the net positive at the far side of it would be that uh, at least uh, a small number of weekends per year, you could rest and recharge if you were, if you were otherwise committed to a traveling role. And the interesting thing will be, you know, that will mean uh, people like Toto, you know, team principal will have to respect it as well. Uh, the race engineers, the ones who have the closest relationship with the drivers, um, you know, Bono and Shav, that's a relationship that lots of people know about because it's they hear it on the radio. Well, they would have to hear a different voice four times a year and uh, and we'd have to figure out how to manage that in a good way. 
Yeah, that could change a great deal of dynamics, couldn't it, within a team and a structure? Um, I joked a little bit at the top about you tinkering around in your workshop, but you love to tinker. This is one of the things you do love doing back at home when you have got some time off. And you've gone and you've sort of said no to that and, and decided to throw yourself right back into the melee in the, in the sharp end of things, um, back at this technical director yeah. role again. So, so what on earth persuaded you that that was a good idea to do that again? And, and how are you sort of embracing it moving forward uh well that's that's quite a long and complex question um <laughs> i do like uh, i do you're absolutely right i do love tinkering uh i could amuse myself forever doing uh doing stuff in in my garage and and on airfields and just just general larking around that's not work related um and the the role that I do in the team doesn't leave much space for that type of self-indulgence. Uh, but, but what it does do is it gives an incredibly rewarding, challenging, yes, but incredibly rewarding emotionally uh, job. And so although I spend maybe more time at work working than I would wish, that time is nevertheless extremely enjoyable and uh, and and exciting, and uh, and if things are moving in a better direction, then incredibly fulfilling and 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 you know makes your sort of sense of uh, of purpose feel pretty energized. So it is what persuaded me to step back into it. Um, uh, I, I'd spent a year and a half or so being half retired, working three days a week, um, which did allow me an awful lot of uh, tinkering around time and playing time, and it was great. Uh, <laughs> but 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 the the downside of it was that I was away from the hurly burly and the fight cliches. I know, but but that's sort of what Formula One feels like to me. And I like I like the fight and the struggle and the and being alongside my teammates in the thick of of that fight and to be still in the company but slightly displaced from what was going on, especially in a period where it was clear that the team was suffering. I I it didn't didn't feel um, particularly uh, good. And so when, when I was asked to consider whether I would come back and take it back on, uh, although I, although I, I was, uh, a little sorrowful that that would mean, uh, uh, sort of curtailing my, my self-indulgent time, it was, it was with a glad heart from the point of view of, um, of tucking into the work alongside my teammates and, and enjoying the fight together to try to get get things moving forward together uh, uh, once more. And James, I know that you always talk about the teamwork. You never sort of single yourself out for any individual praise. It's always very much about how you and your team can work together to make the best of a situation. What do you do with this situation you've got now? Because you walk into a scenario which is sort of unprecedented and there's been no Grand Prix wins for the team this season. How do you t go about turning it around, not just for the car and the technical aspect of what you're trying to do, but also with the people in mind, re-energizing them, Remotivating them. Lewis talked quite um, beautifully, as did Toto, actually, about how you're like the gladiator that everyone wants to go into battle with on the front line, which I thought was a really a, a lovely take on it. But there comes real pressure with that. Do you feel that, or how do you how do you work through what needs to be done next? I well, first of all, the reason I talk about it as a team thing is, and not an individual thing, is because that's what it is. Um, and uh, and all of us just play a, a small part in in trying to make the car successful. Um, and and in terms of what what contribution I can make as my small part in that in that machine, uh, actually the, the 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 role I can play is much less technical and much more human. Than people might guess, uh, the the team is stuffed full of, of 
of very, very strong engineers um, and very, very high levels of technical competence. And so I don't need to teach anything to anyone. And, and in most cases, couldn't even if I wished to, couldn't teach people technically about their specialism and, and their job. Um, so it isn't a technical input particularly that I provide or that anyone who was lucky enough to sit in my seat provides. The The more precious thing for someone in the role of technical director is whether or not we can find it within ourselves to um, to work to work in a way that allows all the technical skill that I just talked about to be harnessed effectively. And when a team has been, as we were, you know, on a very high plateau for a quite a large number of years, for quite a long period of time, and then takes a dip for whatever reason, takes a dip. The is very disorientating. Uh, it's very um, unpleasant uh, to suddenly feel that what you'd previously felt about yourselves as a group um, has been, you know, the foundations of that have been loosened by the reality of the stopwatch and being being beaten by by another team and by other teams. It's it's quite it shakes the confidence of an organisation. And it also puts a lot of very short-term pressures on a company that's been used to thinking further ahead. Mm -hmm. And the short-term pressures are that the car is poor and the results are poor and they must get in, they must improve. And the, the, the call of that is very loud, um, completely natural, but very loud nevertheless. And it, and it, and it, rouses people to action but the action can be can tend to be that that all the disciplines in the company that you know the aerodynamics the vehicle dynamics the drawing office the um all the specialisms that are necessary that work together to create a good car that each of them can sort of scatter on the four five six wins to uh, to their individual corners to do what they can do or see you know, contribute in the way that they think is best, driven by this very loud call that the car needs to improve. And if you're not careful, then then those groups can stop talking to one another because they're all head down trying to fix what they see as their part in in making the world a better place. And if you know, probably the 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 most destructive pattern that that we as a group got into over that difficult period from when we first our crown first slipped uh was that we we fragmented more than we should have done not because anyone fell out with anyone far from it in fact the 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 spirit in this place considering the pressure it's been under has been incredibly resilient but everyone's natural desire to contribute to a, a recovery uh, was a little fragmented. And I would say that if I've had any effect that's been of a positive thing is to try to draw that back together, to try to get the main uh, engineers who are leading the main divisions in the company to, to talk to one another more, to try to take off their shoulders some of the immediate pressure and, and, and just dampen down the shout that is coming from the car uh, and just to focus on on coordinating our work because because if we do that the world will improve and the and the call from the car will quieten on its own um so th i would say that's that's mostly what i've been up to since coming back to the technical director role and that's got nothing to do with nuts bolts springs dampers wings floors it's it's just human stuff um but but nevertheless, that human stuff becomes more and more important the, the further you are up the food chain and the more fortunate you are with, with the role that you're given in the company. 
I mean, anyone who's interested in business listening to this will will totally identify that in that with that in their own way. How do you? So, of course, the, this understanding is that it's a very human role that requires you to pull together all these different groups of people and and put them all back together again, so that you can together contribute to to turning things around. How does that actually look on a day to day basis? I mean, what do you actually do? What are the sort of? Are there some things that you just come in and straight away say we need to do x y z and then at least we're going to put ourselves in a better position uh no no not not so much that as just um uh with 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 the folk who who have at their fingertips you know important slabs of the company so Shav that looks after all of the racing side of things, Loic who looks after all the vehicle dynamics side of things, John Owen who does the drawing office, the chief designer role, uh, Jared Murphy the, who looks after everything aerodynamic. To to pull those people together, other names too, Giacomo Tortora, Ricky Moscone, uh, just bring those um, those important folk together and ask a few questions of them, which the answers to which are only possible if they spend a bit of time talking to one another. Um, and, uh, and, and the, that, yeah, the fact that they then spend that time talking to one another automatically, uh, means that they will, they will, uh, coalesce around a jointly agreed program of activity to, to get, get those answers. And, and it doesn't take too long before people fall back in the habit of leaning on each other rather than working individually, um, because actually it's way more fun that way. Um, and if someone's giving you permission to do it, because those are the questions that need to be answered, then, then that's what, that's what happens. Um, so not coming in and saying, well, we need to get the car three millimeters lower and the spring needs to go to that or whatever. I wouldn't know how to do that, uh, because that, requires people who are um, in the depth of the detail, um, who are um, resources that are under the control of that layer of more senior feed people that I just described. Um, but but those, those people down in the engine room of the team, uh, they need to have be given the confidence by their own leaders to work on, on areas that maybe are going to help and to do so in a manner that is is linked up across the company. How much can siege mentality help against the enemy? I mean, I think of uh, Ben, my husband's sailing team, and I think of when they've been in the pit of despair in cup competitions and it's all looking terribly drab and, and, and a bit grim. And then some someday there's this most incredible performance and everyone just galvanizes. It sort of brings the team together. Yeah. I mean, is there is there the opportunity for that, given where Mercedes is at right now? It's, it's actually can be, and if, if harnessed the right way, very galvanizing. I think the, the sense that we're all in this together, um, 